Despite being named for them, the Persona games never really tell us how Personas work. What little explanation we do get is vague. I grant this power. Persona. It is the power to summon the selves within you. The gods and the demons you harbor. You will be training the power of Persona, which you have awakened to. Personas are, in other words, a mask. An armor of the heart when confronting worldly matters. When you experience a story, you're never just a passive observer. You build a sort of replica of the world of the story in your mind, and you sort of live out the story inside that world. This world contains the people, places, and events of the story, but also the rules and logic of the story. The more complete and comprehensive this mental world is, the more fully you can immerse yourself into it and experience the story more deeply. That's why a really good story is even better the second time. With your mental world, you can see even more how things tie together, look at them from more angles, meaning you can live more fully in the story. My goal here is to explain the ideas and logic underneath the Persona games, to help you build a more complete mental world, and enjoy the series more deeply. Let's get started. Mild spoilers ahead for every mainline Persona game. I will not be talking about any of the spin-offs. I will be talking more about the later games for a few reasons. The slower pace of the later games gives them more room to illustrate their ideas, and they introduce those ideas earlier in the plot, so I can talk about them with fewer spoilers. So I'll be talking about story themes, world details, and gameplay mechanics from all of the games. I'll also talk about plot details from the very early parts of Personas 3, 4, and 5. You are probably good to proceed unless you are very determined to play the series completely blind. If that was the case, I'll see in about 300 hours. Persona draws inspiration from all sorts of sources. Taoism, Nietzsche, the Stoics. But it's hardly subtle about its primary inspiration being the psychology of Carl Jung. As such, the bulk of this video is going to be a primer on understanding Jung's ideas. After that, I will take a look at the games to see how they reflect Jung. I will do my best to make this primer digestible. Jung's ideas are extremely complex. His collective works alone are over 10,000 pages, and the collective works are not complete. I'm only going to cover the topics necessary to understand Persona, and only in as much depth as is necessary. Let's begin with the ego. The ego is, basically, the part of you that is conscious. Jung described the ego as the subject of all personal acts of consciousness. In other words, when you make a conscious choice, the ego is the thing choosing. Anything that you are consciously aware of, be it a thought, memory, or sensation, is in contact with the ego. And the ego is the part of you that holds your sense of your individual self, your identity as a unique person with a unique personality and values. Hearing that, you might be thinking something like, okay, so the ego is me. That is close, but let me draw an analogy. Which part of your body is you? If you had to choose, it would have to be the brain, right? From our perspective, we seem to sit on top of the body, looking out from behind our eyes and hearing between our ears. And all those attributes I just credited to the ego belong to the brain. But there is another answer you can give. Your entire body is you. Your body is not something you can simply part ways with. And your physical and mental health are deeply intertwined. If you start treating your body like some outside entity, you're setting yourself up for problems. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, imagining your ego as you does make a lot of sense. But then I'd suggest you distinguish between you with the ego and you with the person. There is more to the psyche than the ego. And while they are not parts of you with the ego, they are parts of you the person. As inseparable as an arm or a leg. More inseparable, really. We know how to amputate an arm. Keeping that in mind, let's listen to Philemon's introduction in Persona 1 again, and see if it makes more sense. Splendid. There aren't many who can remember their identity when in this domain. It seems you pass that test. But tell me this, are you aware of the many and varied selves you harbor within you? The self suffused with divine love. The self capable of demonic cruelty. People live by wearing different masks. Your current self may be only one of those innumerable masks. <laughs> 
You, though, you have a very firm grip on your identity. I respect your strong will. In return, I grant this power. Persona. It is the power to summon the selves within you. The gods and the demons you harbor. When Philemon asked for the main character's name, that was a test of his ego. That he could remember his name in Philemon's realm means he has a strong grip on his identity. A strong ego. Because of this, Philemon decided he is capable of wielding a persona. Of dealing with the other parts of his psyche. The gods and the demons he harbors. When a weak ego encounters parts of the psyche it doesn't recognize, one of two things will happen. It might simply submit to whatever it has met, abandon its individual dignity and values, and obey whatever urges the unconscious pushes on it. Or it might vehemently reject whatever it encounters. It will imagine it's being possessed by a demon or have a psychotic break, unable to accept that these things are also a part of the psyche. A strong ego, however, can hold onto its sense of self while being part of a larger whole. It can deal objectively with whatever it encounters, and decide what it can accept, what it must reject, and how to navigate the competing needs of the psyche. So what is in the psyche besides the ego? The term Jung broadly used to describe the stuff of the mind is psychic content. This includes the kinds of things we might normally imagine as being in the mind, like thoughts, memories, intuitions, or sensations. All the tiny things that go into making you a unique person. We can think of these as being kind of the particles of the psyche, able to move around and interact with other content. Jung also imagined other kinds of content that might seem stranger to us. These include the ego, but also other things like the archetypes and the complexes. I'll explain some of these stranger contents later. For now we can focus on the simpler ones. There's a kind of physics to how psychic content behaves. Some content has a great deal of energy. I mean that, in a sense, very close to the physical sense. The capacity to do work, to rearrange content, to transform it, or to push us into action. We can roughly measure how much energy content has by how strong an emotional reaction it can evoke in us. Examples of high energy content might be a burning desire, or a memory that can bring you to tears. We can imagine the psyche as being like a physical space, with the ego existing somewhere near the top. The ego itself is a kind of psychic content, and one that is innately high energy. Jung called the psychic energy available to the ego will. That is, your will is how much energy you can consciously choose to enact. Content that is high energy will naturally tend to float toward the top. In other words, things that are important tend to reach our conscious awareness. Lower energy content will tend to fall toward the bottom. In other words, we tend to forget things that don't matter much to us. This isn't an absolute rule, though. Higher energy content may find itself sort of tethered into the lower regions. Or lower energy content might be pulled up by some other content. If you had to memorize the periodic table of elements for school, I doubt the table itself was a very passionate memory. But you used your will to keep it close at hand. Persona 3 shows what a person without psychic energy would look like in its apathy syndrome victims. When the dark hour begins, people turn into coffins. This is a manifestation of their will to live. They sense that death is near, and they instinctively encase themselves in a barrier. But if someone's will to live has eroded, they will remain awake in the dark hour. Such a weak will can no longer contain their shadow, and it escapes. That shadow is a great source of psychic energy. Without it, the former host no longer has the energy for their mind to operate. Their ego falls into the unconscious, and their mind becomes inert and stagnant. Jung analogized psychic energy to water. It flows between content, but it has to follow certain rules. Energy always has a sort of goal, and can only flow toward accomplishing that goal. This goal effectively defines the downhill for that energy. For energy to work against its goal would be like water flowing uphill. And because we always have many different goals, we also have many different kinds of psychic energy. The psychic energy from hunger pushes us to eat, and can't easily be subverted to do something else. And energy can only flow between content that has a connection. That is, it can flow between different ideas and memories, but there must be some sort of link between them in the same way that water needs some sort of stream to flow between places. Suppose you have a project you've been putting off that needs to be done, 
You're having trouble mustering the will to do it. And as you start it, you begin to get hungry. You can't easily turn the energy from hunger toward the project. There's no clear connection, and the project is keeping you from eating. What the ego can do is build what Jung called a canal. The ego can refuse to give in and give some food. This is effectively creating a dam to block the energy of the hunger up. Then it can create a new piece of content to build a connection. I will eat after the project is done. Now the dammed up energy can flow through that connection. Jung compared this to using a river to turn a turbine, transforming energy into a new form that is useful to us. I'll explain this idea a bit more later. Now that we have a basic understanding of the physics of the psyche, I'm going to start filling out our map. Jung organized psychic content into categories based on how accessible they are to the ego. We can imagine these as regions of the psyche. The first is the conscious. This consists of the ego, and all content that is currently within the ego's awareness. That is, whatever's on your mind right now. The second I'm going to call subliminal. I don't believe Jung ever explicitly gives this a name, but he alludes to it in multiple places, and I believe it's a valuable distinction to make. This is whatever content is not currently conscious, but that the ego may call into consciousness at will. The most obvious example would be memory. Do you remember what you had for your last meal? Unless you're eating it right now, it probably wasn't on your mind. But the moment I asked, you were probably able to call the memory forth. That is what I mean by subliminal. Memory isn't the only kind of subliminal content, though. For a less obvious example, consider when you go for a walk. After you begin walking, it just seems to happen on its own. But if you want, you can do it consciously. You can feel the tension in each of your muscles, and direct them as they shift your weight from leg to leg. And you can release it again, and let the process resume on its own. The process shifts between the conscious and the subliminal. And these point to some of the reasons why we have an unconscious. The conscious mind can only hold so much. The subliminal mind seems vastly larger, holding every memory that we can still call to mind. And the deeper parts of the psyche may be larger still. And unconscious processes seem to be more efficient in a way. When you walk manually, it requires a decent amount more concentration, and you become noticeably more clumsy. When you allow it to fall into the unconscious, it becomes graceful and effortless. The next level of the psyche is the personal unconscious. This is like the subliminal in that it consists of content that could be conscious but isn't. Where it differs is that while the ego can choose to recall subliminal content, Unconscious content is beyond its reach. So what kind of content is here? The simplest type is just content that has so little energy that has naturally fallen this deep, like memories that seem like they'll never matter again. There is also higher energy content that we have chosen to forget. This act of choosing to forget content is called repression. Persona 4's TV world creates dungeons based on the personal unconscious of people who fall into it. Let's look at a few of those for examples of what we might repress and why. Saki Konishi's dungeon shows us a version of the shopping district in Inaba. We know since Juness opened a store in the town, many of the local businesses have been forced to close, and Saki's own family business is struggling. Because there is nowhere else to work, when Saki decides to take a job, it has to be at Juness. And at her job, she seems to be a happy and sociable employee. But her dungeon shows us a different story. There's the version of the shopping district there that is darker than the real one. The stores are not just shuttered, but fenced off, and they seem to be covered with blood and vines. She seems to resent Juness for killing the shopping district, but if she showed open contempt for them, she'd lose her job. If she tried instead to bottle it up, she'd just be constantly miserable working there. It would be easier to just forget that contempt, and then she could try to get along and have a little fun. As we look inside her family's store, we learn that her parents and neighbors resented her for taking the job. In her own words, her parents hated her. It's easy to see why she might be desperate to try to forget this. Moving on to Yukiko's dungeon, we see a more complicated metaphor. In the real world, Yukiko is the only child of a family that owns a historic inn. She's the heir apparent of this famous landmark, and is a good student and well-liked, though very withdrawn. In her dungeon, though, the inn is shown as a grand castle. There is a great ambivalence about it all. She sees herself as a worthless princess who is inheriting this grand building that she does not deserve. 
But she also resents it, and wants a prince to come and take her away from it all. But in the real world, she doesn't think she has any choice. So she just puts on the front of someone who should run such an inn, and tries to forget those insecurities and that wish to escape. So we can see that we tend to repress things that either would be dangerous for us to express, or that are painful to acknowledge. This isn't a bad thing. Sometimes we need to forget things for a while to deal with the world. Because higher energy content tends to rise toward consciousness, important things that we repress will eventually find their way back to us, and we can deal with them then. Where repression may become a problem is when we repress too much and too eagerly. If, rather than repressing violent disagreement, we repress all disagreement, we lose our assertiveness and become a stooge. If rather than repressing only painful knowledge, we repress any uncomfortable knowledge, we become delusional. And if, when repressed content comes to us again, we always repress it again rather than deal with it, we become unable to grow. I'll talk more about the effects of excessive repression when we get to the complexes. Finally, we come to the collective unconscious. This may be Jung's most misunderstood idea. When people hear the name, they tend to imagine some sort of telepathic link between all humans. Even Persona is guilty of this error, though we could take that as a sort of creative liberty for the Persona universe. For Jung, the collective unconscious is basically the biological layer of the mind. The content of the collective unconscious are basically organs in a sense. They perform essential functions to keep the mind operating, and they provide us with patterns of thought that we naturally develop as we grow, without needing to be learned. It is collective in the sense that humans collectively have a heart. We don't all share a single heart, and each heart will be subtly different in size and proportion from any other. But every living human develops a heart. So the content of the collective unconscious is not like the content of the other levels of the psyche. While in principle any content in the personal unconscious could become conscious, or any conscious content could become unconscious, content doesn't enter or leave the collective unconscious. Content here might act on the content of the higher psyche, or it might be reflected in other content, but it can never become conscious. Since we are now beyond where simple psychic content can reach, let's return to that topic and talk about what psychic content is down here, and then we can start working our way back out. When we discussed psychic energy, I didn't talk about where psychic energy ultimately comes from. Jung identified two sources. The first we did talk about, the will, the ego's energy reserve. The other is the instincts. By instinct, Jung meant something like a natural drive that pushes us toward certain goals or actions, even if we don't understand why. We can think of the instincts as organs that inject psychic content and energy into the psyche to guide us toward these goals. In a sense, the ego's job is to facilitate the instincts. If, whenever an instinct releases psychic energy, it can find a path to flow along to reach the conscious, and then see its goal realized, then things are going well. If instead that energy can't reach its goal, we can have problems. If there is no path for the energy to reach consciousness, or the ego dams up its every channel, that energy gets backed up. This can lead the ego to feel depressed from its lack of energy. And that energy trapped in the unconscious can create neuroses, which if they grow big enough can begin to usurp the ego's control. I'll explain neuroses a little bit later. Jung identified five categories of instincts in humans. Hunger. This includes any instinct necessary to our basic survival. The drive for food, water, shelter, sleep. Sexuality, the drive to reproduce. Activity, drives to seek change and challenges to help yourself grow. This underlies our desires for travel, exercise, and play. Reflection, drives to find purpose, meaning, understanding. This includes the urge to religion, science, and the enjoyment of art. Creativity, the drives to self-expression and to create art. This might not be a complete list, but it illustrates the variety of instincts we have, and that they may be more sophisticated than we tend to imagine instincts to be. While the instincts are something like innate desires, they are complemented by another part of the collective unconscious that are something like innate understandings. These are the archetypes. The archetypes are basically things we know without needing to learn. They cause psychic content to arrange itself in certain patterns, and thus constitute a sort of intuition. Jung's best-known archetypes are related to common figures, 
The idea of a mother, father, child, hero, sage, or trickster. In our lives we will encounter many people playing these roles, and we will play many of them ourselves. Our archetypal understanding helps us to interact with and play these roles. Roles aren't the only kind of archetype, however. Jung imagined various kinds of events like birth, marriage, or death to be archetypal, as well as more abstract concepts like the dragon and the treasure it guards. According to Jung, there are as many archetypes as there are typical situations in life, so a complete list may not be possible. Depictions of the archetypes in other areas of the psyche are called archetypal images. These are not the archetypes themselves, but are more like symbols that point to the archetypes. What these images look like is very personal to the individual. The mother archetype might be represented to you by the idea of your own mother, or the image of some religious mother figure, or some other matronly role model in your life. We can imagine these archetypal images like shadows that the archetypes cast on the psyche. Each different image shows it from a different angle, revealing different facets of the greater archetype. So every mental image of a hero, for example, portrays different facets of the hero archetype. The archetypes serve one other function in the psyche. They guide us in how to satisfy our instincts. The patterns of behavior that the archetypes evoke in us are patterns meant to help satisfy the instincts. As such, archetypal images tend to arrange psychic content around them in a way that creates good paths for psychic energy. So psychic energy tends to be attracted toward archetypal images, and those images can help create good paths for that energy to find its goal. This might be best illustrated in why we find stories so compelling. A good story takes us on a sort of journey. It provides us with archetypal images in its characters and events. As the story unfolds, we go along on the journey and feel our own instinctual energy flow into the story's images, testing out the channels of energy the story offers to us. This is why stories are good for us. If the story rings true, then its images and paths can survive long after the story is done, and can be used again in our own lives when their images reflect our own story. Probably the best example of this would be Joseph Campbell's idea of the hero's journey. This is a story outline that has been used throughout history and across cultures. It is a sequence of archetypal events with archetypal characters that tell the story of how to become a hero. The hero archetype is one we all aspire to. When we face hardships, we want to be like the hero, come out stronger and making the world better for it. And so the archetypes and instincts have recreated the story countless times throughout history. Persona uses another similar story to make its own list of archetypes, the tarot cards. One interpretation of the major arcana of tarot is that they tell the story of how to live a life, each card representing a role we must play or an experience we must go through. Each one is an archetype. Now let's look at how the archetypes are integrated into the psyche, through complexes. Before I get too far into complexes, let me clarify one thing. In common speech, when we say someone has a complex, it's kind of an insult. We mean that there is some topic that they get crazy around. That is a kind of complex, but a dysfunctional one. For Jung, complexes are not inherently bad, and are absolutely necessary for us to function. So what is a complex? Basically, a complex is a bundle of connected psychic content. At its core is a sort of nucleus. This nucleus contains two things. First, content related to the personal experience that created the complex. This might include the memory of the experience that led to the complex, or the emotion surrounding it. Second, an archetypal image. Around this nucleus, a sort of web of related content will form. That is, content that has some conceptual link to the nucleus will become connected in part of the complex. The most obvious kind would be memories that remind you of the core memory of the complex, though other content like ideas or desires that relate to it could incorporate as well. As more content joins the complex, it grows larger and more energetic. These secondary content can also provide new hooks for the complex to capture new content. New content that isn't sufficiently connected to the nuclear content may instead bind to this secondary content, and the complex may begin to look like a large constellation as a result. The other important thing to know about complexes is that each has a sort of consciousness of its own. They are each a sort of sub-personality. Or you could maybe say that each is a kind of alter ego. When something happens to excite a complex, like some new experience connecting to it, if that complex has enough energy, it may sort of erupt out of the unconscious and take control from the ego. In fact, Jung saw the ego itself as just a very special complex. 
The archetypal image at the center of the ego is one of the self archetype. The self is a very complex topic, but for now we can say that the self archetype is the idea of who you could be if you fully realized your potential. If you found a way to embrace all the different psychic content you have, and to satisfy all your instincts despite how they pull you in contradictory directions, then you would be approaching the self. Because it is centered on such an all-encompassing archetype, the ego has an extremely broad viewpoint. Most other complexes are centered on much more narrow archetypes, and have a very narrow view of the world as a result. For a simpler example, let's look at something everyone has experienced. Have you ever argued with someone on the internet who was wrong? No matter how clearly you explain their errors, they simply cannot acknowledge their mistake. Eventually they might start denying the meanings of common words, or they might completely reverse their position and insist that's what they've been saying all along, despite their previous statements being right there in plain text. In this case, you're almost certainly talking to a complex. It may be an inferiority complex, created to protect the ego from the pain of embarrassment. To this complex, being wrong is not conceivable. It always assumes it must be right. Any reasoning that follows is just to justify that assumption. While you are talking to this complex and not the ego, nothing you can say will change its mind. In psychology, there's a phenomenon called the backfire effect. When someone holds a strong belief and has shown clear evidence that their belief is wrong, they may become more certain in that belief. This makes perfect sense if we're dealing with a complex. If there's some complex set up to defend a belief, then a strong attack on that belief will activate the complex. Any anxiety about the defense actually means more content and energy being attached to that complex in response. So the complex grows. There are a few reasons why complexes might be formed. The first is as a sort of defensive mechanism. Pain or fear can create a sort of psychic soft spot, and the complex is formed as a sort of scar to protect it. The inferiority complex I talked about earlier would be an example of this type. Another common reason is repression of high energy content. If you have something like a high energy desire that the ego can't morally reconcile, that desire may either form a new complex or incorporate into an existing complex. Because desires are ultimately an expression of our instinctive drives, as long as that instinct remains frustrated, it will pump more energy into the complex. The ultimate purpose of this kind of complex is to see its desire realized. As it grows in size and energy, it will intrude into our conscious thoughts more, and if still denied, it will begin rivaling the ego and seizing control more and more often, until it seems like there are two different personalities sharing a body. That is roughly what Jung means by a neurosis. Now let's look at probably the most famous complex, the shadow. The shadow is a complex formed around the image of, well, the shadow archetype. This is the idea of the version of you that exemplifies all the parts of yourself that you don't want to admit to. Because this is such a broad concept, the shadow can very easily incorporate all sorts of content that the ego represses. Its job is to counterbalance the ego, to try to pressure the ego into incorporating this content. Or if that doesn't work, the shadow may temporarily usurp control from the ego to allow this energy to finally be released. If you've ever seen a very mild-mannered person just completely lose control, then you are probably watching their shadow erupting out. Because they couldn't integrate their natural aggression, when it had built up too much, it unleashed itself in a very uncontrolled way. That is one problem with the shadow. By its nature, it's not concerned with the things that the ego is concerned with. So it acts brashly, satisfying repressed instincts with little tact or concern for consequences. That is why its first approach is to bring its concerns to the ego, and only once it's built to a critical mass does it act on its own. I of course can't talk about the shadow without talking about Persona 4. Each party member's shadow is given a voice and allowed to make its case to the ego. Let's look at the first few and see what they can show us. Yosuke's shadow tells him that he's dreadfully bored with life in Inaba. He puts on a facade of being cheerful because he's afraid no one will like him otherwise but it is only a facade. A part of him is excited that he can have an actual adventure. And there's nothing wrong with that. That boredom reflects that his activity instincts are being frustrated. He can't find any meaningful ways to challenge himself in Inaba, and he's excited to finally have a change. 
But Yosuke doesn't feel like he should have any self-serving motives in this, so he denies these parts of himself. Chie's shadow confronts her about her relationship with Yukiko. Chie sees Yukiko as a practically ideal woman, but she also knows that Yukiko looks up to her and depends on her, which makes her feel superior to Yukiko. And Chie tries to keep Yukiko dependent on her so she can maintain this dynamic. In Chie's case, her reflection instincts are trying to demand that she confront this so she can change it and improve. But Chie's ego is too ashamed to admit that she's using Yukiko like this, so she denies it. In both cases, after being rejected, their shadows go berserk. In the real world, this might manifest as the shadow erupting forth and seizing temporary control. But because the TV world allows shadows to separate themselves, the shadow goes on its rampage instead. And in both cases, these shadows describe themselves as the true self. Well, that's half right. They are true parts of their respective psyches, but they're not any more true than the ego. Both are the truth, but not the whole truth. Once each character accepts their respective shadow, the shadow merges back into their body. Psychologically, what's happening here is their egos are finally allowing that shadow content to integrate and become conscious. So the shadow complex is shrinking, and the conscious mind is getting an influx of content and energy that had been repressed. Persona 4 implies that at this point their shadows disappear and become their persona. That's not quite right. Our shadow never disappears, but after it surrenders a large chunk of content and energy to the ego, it will seem dormant to us. So the shadow complex is shrinking, and the conscious mind is getting an influx of content and energy that had been repressed. That's a good thing. Despite how intimidating the shadow might be, it's ultimately the ego's friend. Its job is to find the important things that the ego misses or won't face, and force the ego to confront them. It's there to help us grow and improve. As for whether the shadow becomes the persona, that brings us to our next topic. When the ego has to interact with the outside world, it's usually presented with a problem. We each have this vibrant inner world, filled with our own private needs and desires. But the outer world often puts very strict demands on us that are incompatible with most of what the ego worries about. Jung especially put emphasis on social situations, where we often need to play a strict role and ignore most of our inner desires. So what the ego could really use in this situation is a sort of emissary. A version of you to interact with the outside world that acts out a certain role and is ignorant of your other concerns. Well, we've seen the psyche has a tool just like that. Complexes. Personas are effectively complexes that the ego creates to interact on its behalf with the outside world. The name persona refers to masks worn by actors in antiquity, a mask they would don to play a role and conceal their true self. These are conscious complexes, so in some ways they are different from the unconscious ones we've talked about. Because they are constructed by the ego, that means they must be made of content that the ego has access to. This is one of the reasons why integrating unconscious content is important. A persona made with little energy and content will seem like a flat, unenthusiastic personality. A persona with a great deal of content and energy will seem to have depth and dynamism to it. Persona 4, again, probably best illustrates this. When a party member accepts their shadow, the game tells us that the shadow becomes their persona. But it's more like when the shadow returns content to the ego, the ego can then use that content to build a strong persona. Wearing a persona carries some dangers, however. The biggest comes when we wear one persona for too long. The ego may become used to the comfort of certainty that a persona provides. Living in a relatively simple world, playing a very defined role, the ego may begin to imagine that it is only the persona. As Jung put it, the danger is that they become identical with their personas. The professor with his textbook, the tenor with his voice. Then the damage is done. If this happens, the ego will become rigid and more aggressively repress any content that does not fit well into the persona. This will cause the conscious mind to shrink and the unconscious to grow. In a way, that links the persona with the shadow. The shadow effectively becomes the shadow of the persona, containing all the things that the persona cannot. Needless to say, this huge shift of content and energy from the conscious into the unconscious has very negative effects on the well-being of the ego. Persona 5 illustrates this beautifully in its awakenings, 
After Joker is punished for doing something that he knows was right, he puts on a persona of an honest student to try to fit into society. The on-screen objective for much of the early game is live an honest student life. Soon after Joker is faced with another wrong in the metaverse, his shadow confronts him to ask if what he did before was the right thing. When Joker affirms that it was, a mask appears on his face. A literal persona. The one he has been wearing for society. When he tears the mask off, we see there's no skin under it. This reflects how the ego has withered underneath its persona. But his eyes turn yellow, the sign of a shadow in the Persona universe. As the shadow emerges, Joker's face heals and he gains the power of Persona. The shadow has returned the content that he has lost, making the conscious whole again, and he can use the now recovered content to make a truer and more potent Persona. There's one last misconception about Personas I'd like to clear up. People often describe the Persona as an archetype. Since we've talked about Personas and the archetypes, it should be clear something is amiss at this statement. I think this simply arises from people not understanding what the archetypes are. Rather, Personas are complexes that Jung described as containing a more or less arbitrary segment of the collective psyche. In other words, a Persona may be centered on more or less any archetype, and more or less any archetypal image, as long as it seems that it would be a useful role to play. We see this portrayed in Persona by the variety of Personas in the games. As I said before, the Arcana represents Persona's tableau of archetypes. Each individual Persona, then, reflects an archetypal image that portrays a different aspect of its archetype. For example, the Lover's Arcana represents the experience of forming a relationship. The Raphael Persona seems based on the Book of Tobit, in which Raphael helps to exercise a demon to allow Tobias and Sarah to marry. Raphael represents the lovers in a facilitating role. In Greek myth, Narcissus was a beautiful man who rejected all lovers who approached him. Until he saw his own reflection in a pool of water. Falling in love, he stared into the water until he died. Narcissus represents a false relationship, based on projection rather than reality. The Linanshi in Celtic myth is a fairy who seeks human lovers. She grants them artistic inspiration, while feeding on their life force until they die. She represents a one-sided and parasitic relationship. These are just some of the vastly different aspects that a single archetype may hold. So I've talked about how we have opposing forces in us, desires and instincts that pull us in opposite directions. There is one other kind of force that will help us to understand Persona. Jung called these attitudes. They are different approaches to how we interact with the world. They always come in pairs, which are basically two opposite answers to the same question. We naturally lean toward one attitude over the other, to varying degrees. Jung saw this leaning as something that we have from birth, that cannot be changed by our life experiences. Extreme experiences might cause us to act against this nature, but will cause us to become neurotic until we restore our natural tendencies. He called our natural set of leanings our psychological type. Nowadays, we'd probably call it our personality type. Modern ideas of personality types are very much based on Jung, so if you're familiar with those at all, some of what I'm about to talk about will sound familiar, but I think that it's helpful to understand it in its Jungian context. Let's look at the six attitudes that Jung identified, explaining their strengths and weaknesses. The first set of attitudes Jung identified answers the question of how should I direct my focus and energy. The attitudes are introversion and extroversion. An introvert tends to direct their attention and energy inward. They spend more time considering ideas in their head and on their own thoughts and feelings. An extrovert tends to direct their attention and energy outward to the outside world, and especially to other people. We can illustrate the difference between these attitudes and how they might tend to enjoy music. An introvert is likely to listen to music alone, shutting out the world, focusing on just the song and how it stirs their psyche. An extrovert is likely to listen to music in a group, like a concert or a party. They will focus not only on the song, but also on how it affects the people around them, and revel in the shared experience. We can see that both of these attitudes satisfy different needs we have. Introversion gives us time to reflect on our experiences, and a degree of protection from getting caught up in group frenzies. Extroversion gives us the opportunity to deepen our bonds with other people, to learn from them, and to benefit from cooperation. The other attitudes involve what Jung called functions. These are basically systems the ego uses to obtain and use information. The first set are the perceiving functions, which deal with how we obtain new information, 
Sensation is the system where we get new information using our physical senses. Intuition is the system where we get new information from our unconscious. Sensation is effectively accepting signals from our body. It provides us with our best access to objective reality. What it lacks is a way to put these objective facts in context. It gives no hint as to how what we learn relates to anything else and what possibilities it raises. Intuition, in contrast, is about accepting signals from the unconscious. This is trusting your various unconscious processes to recognize more complex relations and convey them to the ego. This is the function that gives us things like the classic artistic flash of insight. However, our biases and complexes will impact what intuition tells us. Like the famous line in Orwell's 1984, The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. If our biases and complexes are strong, we may easily gaslight ourselves if we rely on our intuition. Sensation, by contrast, has a much firmer grounding. The other set are the judging functions, which deal with how we make decisions. These are thinking, where the ego makes decisions by its own reasoning, and feeling, where the ego relies on unconscious signals to make its decisions. Feeling is like intuition in depending on unconscious signals, and so it shares the same weaknesses to biases and complexes. Because we don't have access to the process behind these signals, it is hard to check the reasoning behind a feeling. Its strengths lie in the vastness of the unconscious, and how it may be faster and hold more information than the conscious mind. Thinking has the advantage in that we have full access to the process. We can better communicate our reasoning and formalize it and double-check ourselves. Its weakness is that it may be utterly useless when presented with a problem we don't fully consciously understand. As you can see, each of these attitudes has strengths and weaknesses. You might be noticing a pattern with Jung. Though we will naturally prefer one of the two attitudes in each pairing, it's important that we incorporate the other as well. They complement each other and affect our perception of reality, so if we leave any neglected, we are in a way living in an incomplete world. If we neglect any of these attitudes, they may end up underdeveloped, or even falling into the unconscious. I mentioned that life experiences can't change our psychological type. That means complexes we acquire cannot change these preferences. What they can do, however, is push us to be more one-sided. A complex might push an extrovert, for example, to seek the comfort of company more, to avoid being alone with their thoughts. This can be a major obstacle to our growth. One last point to keep in mind is that different personas may ask us to approach the world differently, so they may demand certain attitudes from us. If you try to adopt the persona of an entertainer, but can't let go of your introverted attitude, you probably won't be very successful. And I believe that is all the Jung we need to understand the basics of Persona. There is much more to Jung, and some of it does come up in Persona, but that will have to be another video. Now let's take a look at the games and see how Jung is reflected in them. Persona makes a few assumptions to set up its story. The first is that Jungian psychology is basically correct. The second is the existence of what I'll call cognitive realms. These are times and places where the mind can directly influence reality. I'll call the ability for minds to shape reality the cognitive effect. Because the persona's job is to interact with the outside world on behalf of the ego, when someone consciously uses the cognitive effect, it will be the persona that comes forth to act. These cognitive realms differ from each other by operating under somewhat different rules, and the strength of the cognitive effect can vary between them. I don't believe it will be necessary to describe each of these realms. What's important is they allow aspects of the Jungian mind to be manifested into the physical world. I've talked a lot about the importance of stories and the instincts, and I think this shows why the Persona games resonate with so many people, even if they don't really understand Jung. These are largely stories about how to use Jungian psychology to build a strong ego. Our instincts want us to have a strong ego, and that is an instinctive need that is sadly unmet for far too many people. So let's take a look at ways the Persona games tell us we can strengthen our egos, starting with a few common ways that we see repeated throughout the series, then the ways that Persona 3, 4, and 5 focus on very particular lessons. The first common way Persona shows to build your ego, I'm going to call difficulty. I'm not certain that's the perfect word for this. I've considered conflict, collision, strife, and struggle, and none of them quite seem to catch what I mean. What I do mean is facing obstacles that take you out of your comfort zone and force you to strive to overcome them.
That could mean a physical or social confrontation with another person, but it could also mean some challenging task or confronting some part of your unconscious. What matters is leaving your comfort zone to do something difficult. Jung saw the origin of the ego as being from the collision of the body with the environment in infancy. That is, the infant tries to do something in the world, and the world pushes back. This sparks the realization that you are in some way separate from the outside world, and from there the ego is continually grown and refined from collisions with both the outside world and the inner world. To build a strong ego, we need these continual collisions. That is, difficulties, struggle, even pain. Without these, the ego begins to lose its identity. But we naturally shy away from pain, and modern society makes it very easy to avoid pain if we just follow the obvious path and don't raise any fuss. This can seem like an easy choice, avoiding risk at no cost, but we do pay a cost, in the strength of our ego. That doesn't mean we need to go out looking for fights for no reason, but it does mean we should look for things in life that are worth struggling for, and choose to face that struggle. Of course, the most obvious way the games show this is in their RPG mechanics. The party literally fights and gets stronger as a result. That's a genre staple, but it ties into the game themes well. We know this isn't simply getting physically stronger and more skilled. Their personas become stronger as well, and gain new abilities, and stronger personas become available. We can also see this in the negative examples we see in all the games. Persona is kind of unusual in that the people you fight against usually aren't really the cause of the problems. Instead, the core problems are widespread flaws in society. We see these flaws exemplified in the minor and unnamed characters throughout the series. And the games have no shortage of lazy characters just trying to glide through life. And, well, they're not main characters for a reason. In a way, this may be the most fundamental of Persona's lessons. All of the other lessons we are going to see will be nearly impossible to do without also facing some difficulties. The other common way Persona shows to strengthen your ego is with what it calls bonds. Make lots of friends, and make it a genuinely diverse group. Meet people with all sorts of different backgrounds, experiences, and viewpoints. Genuinely listen to them and try to understand them. They will introduce new psychic content to your mind, or reconnect you to content you long ago lost. These will put you in touch with parts of your psyche that have been neglected, and can be new sources of insight and energy to you. This is of course shown in the social link system. The circle of friends that each wildcard forms is huge and kind of absurdly varied. That's the point. That each person represents a different arcana shows how they help the wildcards develop very different aspects of themselves. This development is of course shown in the fusion system. The better integrated an archetype is, the better personas of it can be made, with the strongest personas requiring a deep understanding of the archetype, taught through these bonds. Persona 3 puts a lot of emphasis into using philosophy to strengthen your ego. These ideas can be potent materials to building canals to create new strength. The number of philosophies it references is pretty huge, but there's one that stands out from the rest. Memento Mori. This is an idea most associated with the Stoic philosophers of ancient Greece and Rome. We can translate it as remember death. The heart of the idea is to remember that you, and everybody you care for, will one day die. That may sound very dark to us, but the Stoics turned this into a life-affirming philosophy. The fear of death is an extremely powerful instinct, but usually it's a paralyzing one. It stops us from doing things and makes us run away. But with Memento Mori, the Stoics found a way to turn this instinct into a powerful driving force. When you accept death, there are a few implications. First, we only have so much time. We must make every moment count. Every time you see a friend, cherish every moment of it. Leave nothing unsaid between you, because before you meet again, you might die. Or they might die. Don't let any of that time be wasted. If you ever feel that something is a waste of time, either stop doing it, or find a way to turn it into something valuable. If you're ever bored, find something meaningful to do with that time. Every moment is a precious gift, don't let it be squandered. Second, when you accept that you will die, it becomes not a question of if, but how. In modern society, we've gotten very good at eliminating danger in ordinary life. But rather than be freed by this, many of us act as though we can live forever as long as we don't do anything risky and we live our entire lives restricted by this fear until we find that life has passed us by 
and in a dark irony, that unfulfilling life may drive us to wish for death. But Memento Mori tells us that rather than trying to avoid danger, we should be asking what things in life are worth facing danger for. What all this means is, when you've accepted the idea of Memento Mori, you can connect it to that instinctive fear of death we all have. Then instead of all that instinctive energy going to telling us to not do things for fear that we might die, we can connect it to the things in life that matter most, and ensure that we get to truly live. This theme runs throughout Persona 3, as the cast face the threat of their own deaths, and the deaths of those around them. I mentioned earlier that in the Dark Hour, ordinary people become coffins because of their fear of death, and people who lose that fear succumb to apathy syndrome and lose their shadow. There is another possibility, though. If you can instead face death, not welcoming it, but not letting it paralyze you from doing what you must, you can act freely in the Dark Hour. This is what sets aside the main cast. The design of the Evokers also very clearly draws on Memento Mori. I suspect the main mechanism of the Evokers works by magnetic stimulation. Applying a strong magnet to a person's head can increase or decrease brain activity. The Evokers likely briefly excite the user's brain to amplify their psychic energy, then return to normal to avoid exhaustion or brain damage. But the design also very clearly evokes putting a gun to your own head. Personas were first discovered in a life or death situation, and I imagine the Kirijo group researchers found that evoking the threat of death was an effective way to stimulate personas, and so the design was chosen. Persona 4's central theme is the search for truth. That's both truths about the world and truths about people, including yourself. The game highlights people running from the truth. People lying to society, to themselves, desperately trying to believe comforting lies rather than uncomfortable truths. But ultimately, lies are not stronger than truth. We weaken ourselves by believing and living them. Persona 4's lesson is that we should always be striving to find the truth, and to accept what we find. But that's easier said than done. We've seen that the ego has ways to bury uncomfortable truths. We can repress knowledge that doesn't sit well with us, but we can't really make it go away. It will come back, and the more we repress it, the more strongly it'll make itself known again. It may eventually become aligned into a complex, which may become a real monster to the ego. One thing we find in Persona 4 is nearly the entire cast have very false public personas. By that I mean they're playing roles that they can't very authentically identify with. Very little of their conscious content can fit into the face they show the world. As a result, their personas are in a way very thin and rigid. I mentioned before that when we wear a persona too long, the ego may identify with it, and repress any content that doesn't fit into it. That will always produce a somewhat barren consciousness, but that's especially so when there is so little that can actually fit within the persona. It's fitting, then, that Persona 4's method of strengthening your ego is about confronting your shadow. Confronting the shadow will always be unpleasant. Whatever it shows us will be something abhorrent to the ego. But it's also something true about ourselves. It's by accepting these truths that we can live a more authentic life. Like Persona 4, Persona 5 also focuses on integrating a part of the unconscious in order to become stronger. But for Persona 4, it was about very personal truths. For Persona 5, it's about a very universal trait. An instinctive drive that we all have that few people properly integrate. The will of rebellion. In the world of Persona 5, there's a great deal of corruption in society. People in positions of power commit evils for their own benefits, and the ones who should be keeping them in check instead decide to align themselves with those people to benefit themselves. That leaves only the common people, but most of them have deeply repressed their will to rebellion, because they fear what will happen to them if they stick out, and those who still accept that will of rebellion pay a price for it. We see this first in Joker. When he finds a politician sexually assaulting a woman, he intervenes. The politician gets him arrested on false charges, expelled from his school, and put on probation. He gets one last chance to get his life back, if he can live the role of an obedient student. So he represses that will of rebellion, and adopts the persona of an honest student. Until he learns the truth of Kamoshida in the metaverse. His shadow comes to him and offers to return that will of rebellion, and Joker accepts it, gaining the strength of ego to summon a persona. But Joker has learned a lesson from his experience. The persona he manifests is Arsene, a gentleman thief. 
A man who can blend into society with charm and grace, but also see the flaws in that society and strike against them in secret with cunning and precision. This is what properly integrating your instincts looks like. And I think that covers the basics. I'm going to close out with one example of how we can use Jungian principles to understand aspects of the games that aren't clearly explained. There are a lot of examples I could have chosen, but to avoid spoilers, I'm going to go with something basic that appears very early in the games. What is a wild card? We are told explicitly that the main characters of Personas 3, 4, and 5 hold the power of the wild card. They are unique in their games in being able to hold multiple Personas at once, to switch between their Personas in battle, and to be granted the services of the Velvet Room. What is different about these characters? Looking at the story of these games, one thing stands out. The protagonists are extremely open to different aspects of their personality. They are able to form bonds with a huge variety of people, and as they develop these relationships, they play whatever role is needed at each point in each relationship. It's hard to imagine any of the other characters being able to navigate so many relationships so smoothly. So then, a wild card is someone who has learned to accept all aspects of their personality, and to deftly integrate them. Other characters usually have one arcana they are most in tune with, one archetype that best represents who they are right now and how they see themselves. So could other characters wield multiple personas? Yes, but there probably wouldn't be much reason to. The natural personas we see characters awaken to in a way represents their best attempt to represent their authentic selves. This is the social persona they wear when interacting with the party, and this effectively represents the most complete version of themselves they can muster. They could construct another persona to wear, but it would have to have less content and energy, and so it would be a weaker persona. If, say, a member of the party were trying to hide something from the others, that would mean they were constructing an intentionally incomplete persona. That one manifests as them seeming to switch personas to a less powerful one. By contrast, wildcards have access to a much wider variety of content. There are contradictions between these content, different desires, different ways to see the world, different approaches to solving problems. They can use these incompatible content to make different personas, every one of which is a true version of themselves. What about Persona 1 and 2? The term wildcard is never mentioned in them, but every party member can wield multiple personas, switch between them in battle, and can access the Velvet Room. Are they all wildcards then? I don't think so. There is a persona affinity mechanic in those games. Every party member has different affinities to every arcana. If they were wild cards, they should have high affinity with every arcana. The system is relevant because the Velvet Room services make it easy for them to hold extra personas. The later games don't have this system because no party member ever holds a persona they don't have great affinity toward. As for why they have Velvet Room access, there are story reasons why the rules to access the Velvet Room are loosened in these games. So then, could anyone become a wild card? In principle, yes. It would not be an easy process. They would have to listen to all the small thoughts and urges they have that feel out of character, and work on finding ways to integrate them. This isn't just desires we're uncomfortable with, but also the attitudes contrary to our psychological type. In practice, it would be a tremendous task to overcome our biases and complexes to properly do this. But if you can learn to do this, the result isn't a negation of what you were before, but rather a more complete self, with more tools at your disposal. And I guess that's one more lesson the Persona games have for us. Let's all strive to be wild cards. And thanks for watching. I hope you got something out of this. I spent an unreasonable amount of time working on this and had to cut a lot of things out to keep focused and avoid spoilers. I'll make more videos on specific topics. Let me know if there's anything you'd like to hear me talk about. And before I end this, huge thanks to Mitch and Sparrow for my Discord and Twitch communities. They endured a truly cruel number of drafts of this video to give me great feedback. Also, huge thanks to Gaming University. Dean was a great source of writing advice and sanity checks as I worked on this. If you like this video enough to actually make it to the end, you'll love his channel. I'll link it in the description. And that's it for now. I'll see you guys later. I'm a chef what else should I be? Please don't take off my